Thank you. Okay. Um, I, Christine's co-host. I'm co-host. My name is Chris Henderson. I'm head of agriculture and practical action. And practical action with Christine has been working on the adaptation technology theme, as she mentioned. I mean, today, uh, one of the big challenges we're looking at is how can we get uh, climate policy and plans to be more effective? The objective of the, ov the overall objective of the theme is that we, we know technology works. We know technology excites people, it's, it's exciting. Uh, you can almost speak to everybody about changing the world through technology and technology is a means of implementation. Even in the Paris Agreement, it's a, a means of implementation together with finance and building capacity. Um, the issue is, how can we engage with this and use technology so it works for communities, it works for community-based adaptation? And uh, other theme, other sessions in this theme, we'll be looking at nature-based solutions, we'll be looking at finding the finance, or looking at how young people can thrive. This session is about how policies and plans can be made more effective at scale. So the overarching problem we face is, I mean, everyone recognizes the importance of adaptation. The overarching problem is that um, there's a failure to achieve adaptation at scale. We have projects, but we don't want islands of excellence in a sea of chaos. We want to change the sea. Our hypothesis is that adaptation technology can help governments achieve successful uh, adaptation, to achieve successful climate action. Um, we know technology works. We've got a few presentations coming up, these Ignite presentations that are referred to in this slide. We've got one on coffee agroforestry in Peru. We've got one on uh, soil organic matter in Nepal, where soil organic matter is a, a crisis. We've got one on watershed management and uh, ecosystems-based adaptation. All these things that I'm mentioning, we all know they work. Do we see them going to scale? Do we see policy being effective? Um, I mean, if you look at solar uh, power and maybe electric cars, there's a lot of optimism that it's really going to change climate action. In adaptation, we should have the same optimism and we should find ways to make it work for communities and community-based adaptation. So that is the challenge. What should we, as CBA, do about this? As a community of practice, how can we enable policymakers and planners to use adaptation technologies so that policy really is effective and so that we achieve adaptation at scale? So in order to do this, we're going to have three short presentations. We're going to break out into groups to discuss this challenge. And we're going to report back and hear from you and then have a discussion what we as a community might do. So without further ado, actually we'll go on to the next item, which is the first of those presentations. Next slide, please. Oh, here are the three presentations. So you just have a sense to see what's coming. Carlos is going to present on the challenges in Peru uh, using coffee agroforestry. Monisha will present on their work with the government of Nepal uh, for multi-stakeholder action on soil organic matter. And Devaraj will present uh, comparing his, uh, their experience in two contexts, India and Guatemala, and addressing this middling, middle, missing middle. So I'd like to hand over to Carlos and say you've got five minutes, Carlos, and ignite us. Hello everyone. Hi Chris. Uh, yes, I will continue. So my name is Carlos Rueda from Peru and the thematic lead of practical action in forest and agriculture. And I will uh, share with you this uh, experience of the multi-strat agroforestry in Peru. Uh, first we need to, the next one please. First, we need to understand the coffee systems and the challenges of, the, of their people. And uh, a few years ago, when I was traveling around the, the coffee project sites uh, in the Amazon of Peru, I came across with these pictures. As you can see on the left, there is uh, the traditional coffee fields with many monocrops and many landslides and different problems. Uh, later, when I get to talk 
to the farmers, uh, I saw that they have uh, similar stories, their struggles. And to make a, a summary is that most of them say that they are uh, pretty small farms and always wanted to move forward into the forest to secure their lands of their future generations. They also said that they had no options to access for credit from banks. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of them were not associated and also most of them rely on middlemen to have the cash and also to sell their products. So sometimes their prices were unfair, uh, adding the fact that they, they have low education uh, level. Also, as you can see in the pictures, this couple, many of them say, I'm too old now. Many of them have an advanced age and their sons move to the cities for better quality of life. Uh, so the question is who is going to continue the work that they are uh, working now, the, the parents. And also in, in Peru, said someone or many of them said other crops pay better. And this is uh, because of the high risk to migrate to illegal crops. So you can see that the, the farmers have many struggles. So the outcome you can see on the left is a traditional coffee farm, which is uh, low tech use for productivity and quality, extended use of monocrops that also increase the landslides and diseases and use of many chemicals to control the plagues. Uh, also, there is a high rate of deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions. So this overall, uh, over the, uh, one decade, it managed to shift uh, to multi-strata agroforestry system. So how they shift to this uh, system that we were creating? Uh, over the last decade, we developed a series of technologies, uh, 12 to be more precise, to increase the productivity and quality, but also to conserve the forest and to reduce emissions, and later to engage them, the farmers, to the market. And now we know it works. It's been developing over the years, and it's been better over the years. And you can see on the, on the right, on the pictures, how these multi-layer have different outcomes, the coffee on the bottom and the trees uh, to have a wood layer. And on the other picture on the top, we have a, a, a different landscape that uh, have a better conservation outputs. So the next one, please. And second, once we understand the context, we need to understand uh, the government view and the policy systems, which is why we are discussing this today. So uh, first of all, as you can see the red spots in the, in the map of Peru, this is uh, my country, uh, you can see all these red spots are coffee areas moving into the forest, which is the green areas. Uh, and this is big. It's around 2000 kilometers long this area, it's, it's to put you in context, it's from the coast of Portugal to the end of Germany in the border with Poland. So it's, it's quite big. Uh, so Peru need to work on improve the management of these crops that are on the edge of the forest. Uh, it could be cocoa, it could be cattle, it could be palm tree, it could be coffee. So because the rate of deforestation is 150,000 hectares per year. Uh, but we are on a good track. Uh, the recent policy development focuses on reducing deforestation and climate change. And you can see on the left that Peru has three laws at the national level, three sector specific laws, the NDC commitments and the national adaptation plan as a draft. And all of them include at least one related to agroforestry systems. So that's a good start, uh, but still it's on the national level and also it's, it's still mostly on paper, so it needs to be implemented on the field uh, at the local level. So that's the next step. Uh, there has been some policy advocacy work. Uh, uh, many NGOs and research agencies were involved. Uh, it, we gave technic technical support to improve the agroforestry laws and the sector specific laws. We gave support to the, the development of the NDCs and now the National Adaptation Plan. And we came across and we found, we have this finding that 
uh, diversification is key to adapt. There is no silver bullet to address different problems like climate change, fires, plagues, or lately is, is COVID. Uh, so finally, we know our technology works. It can enable the government to accomplish the goals, but we'll still on the track to be delivered widely. Uh, maybe we have some policy barriers, lack of funds, regional involvement or private sector involvement. So that's our next step in our in the next years. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I mean, <clears throat> that map of Nepal, of uh, uh, Peru, <laughs> I'm thinking about the next presentation already. That map of Peru just shows you if this technology could work, the impact on a glo this global issue, not only adaptation, but mitigation would be incredible. But there is a huge challenge in getting it, as you say, from paper policy into meaningful action. And you came up with one specific suggestion there around diversification, which I think we need to probably look at maybe in the breakout groups. Let's move on to the next presentation. Um, we're running a couple of minutes behind time, so but I'm handing over to you, Manisha, and we should be okay. Thank you. Namaste from the Himalayas. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I bring this question before you today. Can unhealthy soil feed 7 billion people on the planet? We all know that soil organic matter is required for healthy and fertile soils. It's essential for retaining moisture in the soil and for generating nutrients needed for crops to thrive. So most certainly, soil organic matter has a critical role to play in healthy food systems and the soil's ability to feed the current and future generations. But despite this understanding, the problem is that we have opted for the wrong pathway. We have chosen the green revolution. And the problem with green revolution is, is that this has led to farming practices rapidly shifting towards intensive farming, monocropping, and indiscriminate use of chemical fertilizers. We're extracting from the soil and not giving back enough. And this has also led farmers to move away from traditional farming practices. For example, can you please move the slide, one slide ahead, please? For example, farmers have moved away from traditional farming practices such as retention of crop residues, crop rotation, and intercropping, all of which have ways of replenishing the soil. And the consequence, I think we are on the wrong slide. Can we move to the second slide, please? And the consequence is that the average national soil organic, val soil organic matter value in Nepal stands at a staggering 1%. And for soils to be productive and healthy, this value needs to be at least 4%. You know, earlier this year, I met with a farmer. His name was Chandra Prasad Adhikari, an experienced farmer from a place called Chitwan, who started um, commercial farming in 1973 using chemical fertilizers. During the initial days, his production went up and profits soared and he was all happy. But by the fifth year, he started having serious issues with pest management and soil fertility. The result is the profit headed downwards to a point that he even had to consider alternative means of livelihood. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of how decrease in soil organic matter increases the vulnerability of smallholder farmers and threatens their livelihood. What we need is immediate action for adaptation measures. Now, not just adaptation measures, we need adaptation measures at scale.
for it to work for the millions of farmers in the country. Next slide, please. So for adaptation to work at scale, we need policy vehicles. Fortunately, the government of Nepal realized this and has set a target to achieve 4% soil organic matter by 2030 in the agriculture development strategy. And this is also reflected on the enhanced NDC targets. But acting on this problem is very complex. It's complex because the issue of soil organic matter requires a paradigm shift in farming practices, shifting farming from chemical laden, chemical input laden agriculture to agroecology based farming systems. And a change of such magnitude requires changing the behaviors of all the actors engaged in the soil agenda, smallholder farmers, fertilizer industry, researchers, policymakers, implementers, development partners, everyone. Practical Action in Nepal has been working with the Ministry of Agriculture Development to develop a multi-stakeholder action plan to enhance the soil organic matter. And this document has identified the seven key pillars. And this requires engagement of a host of stakeholders. Now, we believe that the action plan offers the alternative we desperately need for adaptation to work at scale for smallholders and for the planet. But the challenge is how can we support the government to get all stakeholders, the community on board to achieve adaptation at scale? Are there any successes that we can learn from? I'd like to hear from the practice on what has other governments done in a similar situation? What would be the entry point for, next slide please, sorry, next slide. So what would be the entry point for engaging all these stakeholders to actively work on the seven pillars to make adaptation work? And in conclusion, I leave you with another question. How can multi-stakeholder action on healthy soil build resilience of smallholders? Thank you. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Manisha. So where there you have very strong commitment from government and a huge problem across the country. Government may have a great plan. We may have a great plan with them, but to solve it actually requires joined up action, including action with communities. That's the challenge for us. Let me move on quickly to Devaraj so that we can conclude in this 30 minutes, this section, Devaraj. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Devrat Lukandapa. I'm working at TMG Research in Berlin, uh, think tank based in Berlin. So today we're going to tell you some of the work we are doing in terms of uh, upscaling EBA in Guatemala and India in our project Climate SDG Integration Project, um, which is being funded by the International Climate Initiative from the German Ministry for the Environment. So we are working with partners in Guatemala, ADIMI and uh, WWF, and with water in India. Next slide, please. So um, we, why are we talking about upscaling EBA? Um, I'll be very brief here, but as you surely know, uh, nature-based solution, NBS, are being backed by global agreement, let it be the Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change or the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this convention especially refers to ecosystem-based adaptation, which is basically adapting with the help by conserving and by using ecosystem services. So our starting question was how to scale up the adoption of EBA. Next slide, please. So to do so, we have organized our project at the three level of intervention, the local, national, and global level. Um, so why so? Often we, if we look at the local level, uh, we can notice there are several cases of EBA, which are more or less successful, but which tend to be isolated in time and space. 
If you look at the national level, you have different policy which are in place, but which tend to be sectoral and compartmented, and usually don't really conduce uh, upscaling of EBA. So if you want to say there is a missing middle between the national and the local scale. And what we wanted to do in our project, the main objective is what you see in the middle in green, is to create an enabling and policy environment to upscale EBA. So how do we do so? Uh, we are working on a roadmap to upscale EBA to connect the local with the national level. What do we do concretely? First, at the local level, we have, we're doing some field research to study how uh, EBA is effective, to gather evidence on this effectiveness. And this feed from the local to the national level to, to feed on this evidence. And the objective eventually is to mainstream EBA in the different policy that uh, we have at the national level. And then by going back from the national to the local level, we are aiming to implement this mainstreaming, to implement EBA by having synergy in planning, investment, monitoring, and evaluation, for example. And, and we're also working at the global level, as you can see on the top, in the sense upscaling EBA can help to achieve some of the international targets, for instance, the SDG, the NDC. So we make sure that this is included in the national reporting to this uh, international agreement. And lastly, what you see at the outer cycle is uh, we are fostering a chain of exchange between Guatemala and India where we are in both countries, we are uh, gathering evidence on EBA effectiveness. So we are having an exchange between these two countries, but also at the international level, at the global scene, where we are reporting our field research evidence on EBA. Next slide, please. So I'm going to end just now to give you some, exam some uh, illustration of what it means, uh, roadmap development in India. So there we are having a demand-driven and evidence-based roadmap. Uh, we are doing so by organizing a series of thematic sectoral uh, stakeholder consultation in this, uh, involving people from the agriculture, water, biodiversity sector. We have formed a multi-sectoral committee to support us in the process, to help us uh, mainstreaming EBA, to help us identifying the government, the national scheme which are existing, which can be relevant. And I want to uh, end just with uh, one of our indirect impact uh, of uh, our multi-consultation is that nowadays there are ongoing discussion about the recognition of EBA in the pr process of reforming watershed development program. This is not directly our uh, impact, but it's indirectly in the sense that we have invited a national stakeholder in our workshop and they have carried away this idea of upscaling EBA and including EBA into other programming, that is how it is illustrated and we are pretty happy about that. That's all, next slide, Leticia. And that's all from us today, thank you. Thank you very much to all three speakers, Devaraj, um, uh, Carlos and Monisha. Um, now you will have noticed okay it's been pretty much one-sided at the moment we've been sharing with you these examples um and and your it's a listening mode let's get we are we are however on track with 30 minutes and we can move to um the breakout groups uh, the idea is some of these presentations may have provoked you to thinking yeah but this won't work or this will work let us move to um let us move to the breakout room questions. Now, here are three questions. The first one is asking, how can policymakers better learn from communities and practitioners about adaptation technologies that work? I mean, the India example, I think, and the Nepal example are great ones. I mean, the policymakers have got a clear vision with the watersheds or the soil organic matter and what they want to do. But to turn that into reality so that it really works across the watershed, across the sort of soil agricultural uh, landscape is going to require a lot more and it needs effective learning from what works in communities with farmers by communities that's the first one the second one is what can we do as a community of practice to facilitate the uptake of these technologies that work for communities and the last one may be deep, deep diving down into the barriers and the enablers of the uptake of adaptation technologies, which community probably can address those barriers and those enablers. These questions are prompts for you. What matters is that you have an active 
a creative, uh, a constructive discussion on the overarching question, which is how adaptation technologies can improve the delivery of, of policy and planning so it's more effective and deliver adaptation and climate action. So you're going to be uh, autumn, uh, allocated groups by the organizers. You don't have to pick, uh, do all three questions. You need uh, an active and a constructive discussion with key points of action. You've got 30 minutes and we're going to break out now. Okay, let's kick off then, shall we, with the first group. Oh, well, actually, I was in the first group. <laughs> Do you want me to read the... I just think you need to pick the top three or four points, as we had put in the yeah. chat. Um, if you haven't got them, but you can do them if you have them, which would be great. Okay, from group one, the top four points that we have come up from the discussion is how best can we <coughs> localize adapt adaptation technologies issues and diversify the discussions, positioning the community as a stakeholders in, in the projects, maybe in decision making, incentivize the community to be part of the climate policy dialogue, and lastly, harvest and scale indigenous knowledge and technology so that it can spread around and everybody gets the technology. Thank you. Maybe if I left somebody, something my team can add, but I think those ones are the four key ones. One thing I think the group would have wanted you to add was about co-creation is really important. Oh, yeah. It's been known about for a long time. I and mean, I think one of the things they identified is that some departments actually do work more closely with communities and they need to be involved in this co-creation from the beginning and their voice somehow needs to be empowered so that they influence policy better. It's not the norm. Perhaps those departments are the ones that are not normally given power in policy making. Um, Our organizations need to get better at learning from communities and be political with how we use that learning. I thought that was an interesting message, telling us to be political and be involved in advocacy. Interesting point. So I think uh, if our group is unhappy with that report back for now, please put it in the conference chat to make sure your point is up there. But because of time, we do need to move to the next group. The next group is Christine and Amias, where they were the reporter and facilitator and rapporteur. So um, I'm reporting back on behalf of uh, group two. Why is my Google Doc not open? So, Okay, so for, for question one, what, uh, what emerged was the issue of the need to generate the scientific evidence. Since policymakers work with evidence, so we need to have that evidence that will allow them to integrate adaptation technologies within the policies. Then another issue was to consider community local community plans should be integrated into township or district development plans. And this would act like a buy-in from the communities and would also attract the co-financing from them and be able to scale, to bring to scale adaptation technologies. Then there was uh, on the second uh, issue of, uh, on the second question, uh, uptake of adaptation technology, we noted that there is an issue, of, there is a gap between the local and the national level. So we need to empower communities to also be able to develop and input into the government plans the relevant adaptation technologies that they feel are appropriate. Then for question three, 
there was as an enabler, one of the barrier was the cultural barriers and so the, the group thought it prudent that the communities should be involved in decision making from the word go when these technologies are being designed and uh, being implemented, are being uh, highlighted in their regions. And also engagement with the networks so that the networks, uh, for example, the CBOs, the NGOs can be able to advocate for the existing adaptation technologies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Um, I, I think there's some very concrete, very practical suggestions there. This is really great. Um, I, I uh, yeah, well, that's a great example. We'll come back to it. We'll have time for discussion. Group three uh, is um, Manisha and Marie Claudia. So, Maria, I think you Yes. Uh, well, we mainly have a very interesting conversation based on question number three, which are the barriers and enables of the uptake of addiction technology. And I think uh, there was three key points uh, addressed within this question. The first is a really big barrier we need to address is that mainly policies or sometimes they are gender blind. Uh, they don't focus on and the participatory methodologies that are used usually not include women or vulnerable uh, communities, especially if they are really far away in rural areas. So it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, some of the causes for this is the lack of information uh, of the needs and the problem of women and that policymakers need to be uh, embedded with these communities and their problems to actually a mainstream gender within the policies. Uh, the second key point that was mentioned is that even when climate is mainstreaming within national policies, uh, local policies and local planning is usually climate blind. They are years behind when it's regarding mainstreaming climate and adaptation technology within their planning. So. Uh, this is a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed. And on the other hand, community or also need to be informed and aware of the advantages of these adaptation technologies and the disadvantages of traditional uh, ways of agriculture. And finally, uh, something that was uh, addressed was that uh, sometimes policies uh, are based on the needs of the private sectors and the market and, and is moved by the market. Uh, if the industry needs some agricultural product, for example, it is usually really promoted uh, at a national level. So it was pointed out that there's need to be a balance between what uh, the private sector needs and the markets and what is better for communities and their development. So this is basically the three points uh, we get to address within this question. We also talk a little bit, but not too much, about the first one. Um, the, the first question about policy makers learn from communities. But we basically just uh, talk about how even so governments are willing to learn from communities, sometimes the resources are not enough and it is really challenging and it's difficult, but they need to prioritize some areas to influence and actually mainstream and do all these participatory uh, adaptation that need to be to mainstream climate within their policies. And that's everything I think I have to say for this session. Sounds like you had um, a really valuable uh, conversation mm -hmm. and the gender focus i mean one thing i wanted just to be clarify were you saying that admittedly the national and local policymakers don't have the same perspective on gender and you are saying that the local policymakers are more blind than the national ones yes that was a right. something Despite that came out uh, yes uh, well in terms of ge uh, gender uh, no, they just mentioned in general at a national level, sometimes it's not considered. But in the 
in the climate uh, approach and streaming, normally the local policies and local planning don't include climate or adaptation technologies. It's not that they are not aware, but it is not included uh, this national approach within their local policies. Okay, so the distinction there between gender and mm -hmm. policies on yes. climate adaptation. Thank you. Next person, next group I have on the thing, group four, you've got Carlos and Manila. I think it's Manila's going to report back. Uh, yes, Chris, thank you. Uh, so we had a very uh, interesting discussion in our group. We had very diverse participants from different countries. Uh, we discussed in all three questions, but basically we tried to answer the main question, how can adaptation technologies be used to make climate policies and plans more effective? We discussed in our group uh, that uh, policy design is not an issue. It's not a problem. In every country, we design a very good policy through a collaborative process, but the implementation of the policy is a key challenge. Investments is a challenge. So it really requires a very strong political commitment from the governments, and not only from the governments, from community and all the related stakeholders. Uh, we discussed in a um, group that key barrier for adaptation technologies not going to scale uh, is ignoring the community who adopts the uh, adaptation technology. You know, we ignore the community, we ignore their uh, local indigenous knowledge and understanding. We try to ignore their needs. So the key suggestion that we have received is that engaging the um, community, local people in adaptation technology is key for uh, taking these adaptation technologies to scale. And another suggestions uh, that we received from our group is that the first one is uh, we need to sensitize, we need to create awareness about the adaptation technologies to everyone. We need to sensitize community, we need to sensitize policymakers, and we need to sensitize all uh, relevant stakeholders engaged in adaptation technologies. The second point that we uh, found is that evidence. We really need very good evidence. Uh, from local level, from ground level, and most of the times uh, we document only the successful evidence uh, to inspire the policymakers, but uh, but it, it doesn't always work. So we have to document uh, the evidence from the ground, not only the successful cases, but also the failure cases, what works and what does not, so that we can really inspire and inform our policymakers. Another key point that we discussed is about the engagement. So we need to engage uh, community people, but we also in, need to engage uh, government, all different types of the government, uh, not only the local government, because sometimes the local government has a uh, very limited reach. So we need to uh, engage all different types of national, local and provincial uh, government uh, in the adoption of the uh, climate technologies. Um, if the local government is inspired and convinced, then uh, then it's very easy to replicate widely in other areas too. And another uh, point, the most strong point I would say that came out from our group is effective communication. We really need to communicate evidence uh, effectively uh, to all the stakeholders, to everyone in a way that everyone understands, you know, and feel the gap on how technology can be conceived. Uh, we discussed that the science had to be beyond the evidence and the idea had to be well understood by everyone. Thank you, Manila. Last but not the least is about the community-based uh, advocacy because uh, it's the community who are adapting the technologies, you know, so we need to empower communities so that they can advocate on their own for the adaptation technology. So we need community-based uh, advocacy. Yes, Good that's point. all from our group. So there was a lot in your group. There was a lot there and we mustn't lose that richness. So I think we're going to have to capture those points well. Uh, interesting was your message that if local governments are convinced, it's easier to convince national governments. I do feel there's some contrasting messages coming through here between about the differences in the strengths and weaknesses or relevance of lo local and national government. We don't have time to unpack it, sadly, though. We need to go to the next group, which is Devraj and Rafida. I can't remember who is feeding back. I think it's Rafida. 
Hello, everyone. So our group also has uh, emphasized on, uh, on uh, response to question when emphasized on the importance of creating the link between the community and the policymakers and building that space where the community can have their voice heard and also to create that co-learning and co-producing uh, environment. And it also they emphasize on the importance of testing and ensuring that uh, these ideas or this knowledge are, are effective on the on the long run. Um, they also said about to achieve this link, it's important to um, uh, capitalize the role of the CBOs, the community-based organizations, because it's, they are underestimated and they need to be, uh, they are very close to the communities and they can create that links between the, the policy level and the, the community level. Um, uh, for the for the second questions, um, the they talked about the importance of uh, bridging that gap and bringing the knowledge to the ground and establishing that connections uh, into different level. Uh, also, they mentioned uh, the importance of including the, the academia, the researcher, and the, the uh, from the local universities because they they also have the the local context and they they have the knowledge and they can support on, uh, on developing the, the policies uh, but this is all um, shows how it's important to for the communities to be really involved with that from the beginning uh, regarding the question three the, the enablers uh, uh, for the for uh, techno adaptation technologies um, there was an, an examples from Kenya on the use of uh, incentives uh, to, in, to not necessarily money incentive by providing subsidies or trainings or, or um, uh, others uh, to help communities uh, to help adapting or to be more uh, adapting um, uh, using adaptive uh, practice. Um, uh, interestingly, the the group also talked about the role of the private sectors and how they can have really um, uh, particularly the the small producers and the cost small cooperatives, uh, how they can be a real uh, enabler uh, for adapting technologies and how they can help uh, um, uh, providing services and support the livelihood um, by providing access to the market uh, and uh, uh, providing services uh, at, the, at the local level. Uh, also with bearing in mind the sustainability of, of the private sectors because they are really concerned about um, the, the um, profit uh, making profit and this is required the government to support uh, by providing subsidies or whatever so That's all. Thank Ida, you. I think you've provided a segue there or your group have provided a segue to the session on Thursday about finding the finance where we're looking at the business case for government to invest in these incentives to, uh, to for uptake of adaptation by people and private sector investment too. Anyway, two more groups to go through. We're not doing so well in time at the moment. It's so uh, tr try and keep it quick so we have an opportunity for feedback, or other dialogue as well. Maria and Anna. Maria. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chris, uh, for that. Uh, what was coming out strongly in the group uh, for the first question is the, the need for documentation and evidence generation so that uh, clear messages can be shared with the policy makers. And also that the policies also need to be appropriate enough to address the various contextual needs uh, of the different communities. And uh, there was also, what also was coming out was that there is need to include all the stakeholders and also getting the youth um, involved as well. Then on the second one on how the community of practice can, you know, um, enhance uh, uptake. Uh, what came out strongly was that there is need for all the practitioners to acknowledge that indigenous knowledge systems are very critical and we should not just go into communities and uh, come with the top-down approach, but to also look at what, how the communities have been handling uh, and what technologies are existing there. And then we then build up from there. And then there was also, um, what was also coming out was that there's need 
uh, to identify models which work for particular areas to address specific issues using the technologies. And then once that is done, they, they is need then to validate that it works and find ways of upscaling uh, with others. And then on, there was also, on the second one still, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also uh, what was coming out was there's need to enter into MOUs with local, uh, local area authorities and governments to demonstrate uh, technologies which work within those local communities and those can be used to influence at a higher level. And then on the barriers, we just managed to bring out a few, um, the educational levels, also the differences in farm income, and finally, limited access to agriculture extension. Thank you, Chris, over to you. Maria, thank you. Um, and the groups have done so well, you've covered all these questions. Um, this is rich points here. Um, engaging the youth, there is a session on Thursday about that. Adaptation technologies that will enable young people to thrive. Um, that can deep, dive down deep into that one. Last group, group seven, um, Robert and Harrison. I think Robert, uh, you were nominated to give feedback on this one. Hi Chris, thank you very much. Well, we had a very interesting discussion and regarding the question one, and I think a lot of points that we discussed really resonate well with other groups, uh, with what other groups have discussed. So in terms of the point one, point one uh, it was, there was a lot of talk about uh, a need for policy policymakers to address and recognize the grassroots initiative. So to understand that communities are central for the process, to understand uh, and recognize their indigenous knowledge, their endogenous technologies, their context-based technologies. Uh, and also there was a mentioning that, you know, related to local knowledge is that communities uh, really have the crucial data that can provide uh, that they can uh, uh, facilitate the uptake of, uh, of adaptation technologies uh, and their better effectiveness. So for instance, uh, communities affected by flooding will be uh, best placed uh, to know where the floods happen. So to help with you know, the local risk information. Then how do we if, we, if we think of the second question, it was very connected to what was discussed in the first in the terms of uh, how do we, you know, how do we make, uh, how do we enable and facilitate the sharing of these lessons. And uh, the group proposed that kind of a three step process. It was a lot about a need for a platform where uh, the platform for policymakers, practitioners and communities, where we can create the linkages between the three groups and share best practices. It's partnering with national and government agencies responsible for research and development. And it's also uh, that, you know, policymakers can learn and be guided in developing policies that support adaptation technologies that will work for local communities. Then similar to other groups, there was a lot of emphasis on the need for evidence. So good policies need to be evidence based. So that's, that's really important. Um, when it comes uh, when it comes to uh, the barriers and enablers, one of the big barriers we identified is just this mismatch between you know rhetorics and between practice when it comes to uh, involvement of local communities. Uh, so there is this huge disconnect between local communities and policymakers and universities and researchers, etc. So it's very difficult for local communities to have dialogue with policymakers due to lack of connectivity, different levels of education, and just existing hierarchies. Uh, so there is a very limited flow of information between national and local levels. So community-based organizations could be a key enabler there. Uh, one thing that uh, we thought was was really really important was not mentioned, uh, I think, so far was just uh, thinking of the sample, thinking of the scale. So one crucial problem when it comes to the upscale of adaptation technologies that we need to think about is the fact that they are local they're based on the local context environmental social and political context so you know how not to lose that contact basedness while mainstreaming it into into policies thank you thank you robert um look we are one minute over time, but I'd like to say we've got something really quite valuable to do. We do need to, I think, get takeaways from Christine, who's been listening to all of this as co-host, and takeaways from Peru, Nepal and India, the three presenters. Uh, if we have time after that, we can also get takeaways from others. 
Can I start with um, Devaraj and then Christine to follow? And then we'll co come to Carlos and um, who am I missing? Manisha. But really, it's one minute. The question is this. You presented a case of EBA and watershed in India. You've heard all of this. Is there anything now you can take away from this that you might might help with your work going forward in India and Guatemala? Well, just to remind of our work, we, we are trying to elaborate a roadmap to, to have this upscaling of EBA watershed program. And I think, I mean, one of the takeaway we have in short from today is how can the, 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 the role of the private sector in this, in this, in helping to sustain first, you know, um, uh, in, initiative with beyond their funding, beyond a project, be, be beyond the life, the time, the lifetime of a project. So if you have a private sector involved, let it be to cooperative or small farmers connecting maybe to other bigger private farmers, they might help to sustain by bringing, uh, by enhancing ma market access. And that also can be help helpful in the roadmap when we want to scale up. And the private sector could be something, uh, uh, a player in addition to the government and the local community. That's a great takeaway. Thank you, Devraj. I mean, that's interesting challenge to people as well. Uh, passing now to Christine. Um, I mean, I, I knew Devraj had to leave. That's why we went to Devraj. We will come to um, Carlos and Manisha next. But Christine, um, from what you've heard, I've written two down for me, but what are your takeaways? Thank you, Chris. Uh, my main takeaway from this is that we need the research evidence on the adaptation technologies that are working and how this can be integrated into policies and plans. Then the next is uh, we need to also empower communities and involve them in decision making when drafting the policies and actions so that they can input on the issue of adaptation technologies that can work for their respective uh, localities. Then there is an, uh, also the need to capitalize on the role of uh, CBOs and also networks, as well as communities to be able to advocate for adaptation technologies that work. Thank you so much. I wonder whether the NDC process, which everybody's saying must be consultative, is that a way to, we should use that uh, to empower communities for you know try and get them and those cbos to engage in this ndc process um moving quickly on though um can i see carlos hello greece yes uh i have three more takeaways oh i'm not session. sure you've got time for three you've got to yeah, make so i was just going to say from the three i'm going to say one that I hear be, before and I think applies to Peru. That is that is the importance of of the youth in this in these uh, changing aspects. It is the next generation, and we saw that for the coffee agroforestry farmers, they have they have an advanced age, and the youth is moving away from the fields. So we need to work on that in order to have a, a continuous uh, impact over the years. If not, you will have a, a problem of, of... And you think that could change government? Could that change yeah. government policy and planning in Peru? Exactly, because the youth is more actively uh, in, in policy. Nowadays, the youth has a, a, a bigger role in the policy. So they, they have the power to make this change over the time. It, it's not a thing that it will happen in the next year. I like the idea. They'll be around to fight the battle later on, too. Exactly. Uh, there are other two ones. Can you put them in the chat box? Because I really realize I was a bit naughty. I cut you off, but I do want to give money. Oh, and then everybody else. Whilst we're on, because we are interested in your takeaways, too, please can you put, if you feel we're not going to, we're out of time, we're not going to get them, put your takeaways in the chat box whilst this is happening. But in, whilst that's sure. happening, Manisha. Thank you, Chris. I think in the case of Nepal, um, the key takeaways have been about the co-learning and co-producing platform, 
creation of that platform is uh, what is key, I think, and it has to be sustainable. That platform in itself has to be sustainable. And what uh, really drew my attention was uh, the point on sensitizing all stakeholders on adaptation technology. When we're dealing with multi stakeholders, we need to be able to sensitize all of them. And to do so, we need effective communication of evidence to all stakeholders in a way that they understand. I think that is the key uh, to get everybody on board. That's what the government of Nepal needs to do. They need to create a platform and they need to sensitize everyone involved and communicate in a manner that uh, that is understood um, by all the stakeholders. So for private sector, they have to speak in their language. For researchers and academia, they have to speak in their language. So that's my key takeaway. Thank you, Chris. Over to you. Thank you. Um, well, I think what this session has highlighted so far is that there is a lot of work still to be done on gender, on youth, on addressing this disconnect. And the disconnect is in many places, it seems to be, between national and local government, uh, in the use of indigenous knowledge, in maybe getting CBOs connected uh, in the policy process, in engaging the private sector. My takeaway is more of you have talked about advocacy um, than I would have expected prior to this um, meeting. And in CBA, we haven't really talked a lot about, well, have we talked about advocacy as much as this before? I don't know. I wonder whether there's a change in tone because of the importance of the challenge facing us and the need to find win-win solutions and get that evidence out there. Um, we have run out of time. We've gone eight minutes over, according to mine. Um, and, and unless uh, I see, I don't, someone's told me i've missed something absolutely critical that somebody a point someone wants to make i'm going to suggest we actually do wrap up um but i want to thank everybody uh, sincerely i think it's been a brilliant session maybe if you uh, see where the reactions are you can give us a thumbs up a thumbs down whether you want to follow on you've still got the chat box they're live there for a moment but the discussion goes on on the notice board and we will try and uh, write this up with the main action points coming from this session. Christine, thank you to you for co-hosting with me. Sorry, I've talked a lot, but I hope it's been worked for you as well. Thank you too, Chris. Thank you, everybody.